Well, tonight we're looking at chapter 35 here in the book of Ezekiel. And so we'll begin reading together in Ezekiel 35 at verse 1. I'll read verses 1 through 4, introduce, give some context, and move into this passage. Ezekiel chapter 35, beginning at verse 1. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, set your face against Mount Seir and prophesy against it. And say to it, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, O Mount Seir, I am against you. I will stretch out my hand against you and make you desolate. I shall lay your cities waste, and you shall be desolate. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. So as we begin this very cheerful, very upbeat study tonight, <laughs> what we see here is, is Ezekiel continuing giving the word of the Lord as he has been, especially in the uh, previous chapter, as he has been uh, concerning judgment that is coming. Now, he'd been giving messages that related to various people in the nation of Israel. In uh, chapter 34, as we've seen, he had given prophecies to the shepherds, the false shepherds of Israel. He had spoken concerning the wicked ones who were there, who would be referred to as goats, and he also had given a word of encouragement to those who were believers in the Lord who would be referred to as, as sheep. And he had promised that the shepherds and the wicked would be dealt with, but he also gave a promise that the sheep would be blessed by God. Now, as he was giving this message, he gave a word to prepare them, to prepare them for Messiah, Messiah who was yet to come. And he was saying that in the future, Messiah would come, set up his kingdom, a kingdom that had been promised to King David. And in the future, yet future, he would rule over a restored nation that had been regathered from the four corners of the earth and returned to Israel. He had said that your followers, his followers rather, would have grace and peace. They would have comfort, security. They would, they would have lives free of oppression. And instead of the shame that they were living with, he said they would have fame and they would have honor. Notice in chapter 34, verse 29, he said, I will raise up for them a garden of renown. They shall no longer be consumed with hunger in the land, nor bear the shame of the Gentiles anymore. In other words, they're going to know the Lord. They're going to be called his people. And they're going to be known for this relationship that they have with God. Another prophet by the name of Zechariah had written in chapter 8, verse 23, has written, Thus says the Lord of hosts, In those days ten men from every language of the nation shall grasp the sleeve of a Jewish man, saying, Let us go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. And so this nation that has been dispersed is going to be regathered and ultimately under the rule and reign of Messiah is going to be known for their relationship to God. Isaiah in chapter 60 verses 3 and 4 says, The Gentiles shall come to your light and kings to the brightness of your rising. Lift up your eyes all around and see. They all gather together. They come to you. Your sons shall come from afar. Your daughters shall be nursed at your side. So God says, I am going to regather you. Though you've been dispersing, you will be dispersed in the future. Yet in these latter days, when Messiah is ruling and reigning, I will regather you. And the nation will be blessed. So as he's been speaking concerning this, in chapter 35, he returns to his theme of of judgment, the destruction of the, the enemies of Israel. And here in chapter 35, he refers to the people of Mount Seir. So when he says in verse 1 here in chapter 34, moreover the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, set your face against Mount Seir and prophesy against it. He's speaking against the people that were in the region of Mount Seir, which we know as the Edomites. So the Edomites were there in this particular region, a region that was there south on the Dead Sea to the east. And it was just below the ancient um, land of Moab. And I know that all makes sense to you. It's kind of like it's just below Ontario like Chino is. Or Pomona, if you will. It's just geographically lower. And in that, what he's speaking concerning is the fact that he's bringing judgment against these people. Now notice how he says in verses 2 and 3, that, that Ezekiel is to set his face against Mount Seir and prophesy against it. So early in the history, Mount Seir had become associated with Isaac's son Esau. If you take notes, it's all the way in Genesis, chapter 36, verses 8 and 9, where it says Esau lived in the hill country of Seir. Esau is Edom. 
These then are the records of the generations of Esau, the father of the Edomites in the hill country of Seir. And so he's speaking concerning these people, and he's speaking a word of judgment. You see, from the early days, the Edomites and the Israelites were bitter enemies. It actually began with Esau. Esau hated his brother Jacob. That goes all the way back to Genesis 27, 41. So Edom has a historic hatred for the nation of Israel. And it makes her a good representative of all the nations that hate Israel. When you read in the uh, book of Lamentations written by Jeremiah in chapter 4, verses 21 and 22, there it says, Rejoice and be glad, O daughter of Edom, who dwells in the land of Uz. But the cup will come around to you as well. You will become drunk and make yourself naked. The punishment of your iniquity has been completed. O daughter of Zion, he will exile you no longer, but he will punish your iniquity, O daughter of Edom. He will expose your sins. So God is saying, I am against you, and I am going to stretch out my hand against you. I am going to make you, notice verse 3, most desolate. I shall lay your cities waste. You shall be desolate, and then you shall know that I am the Lord. So I'm bringing judgment against you. I will devastate the nation. The judgment against Edom occurs in a couple of phases. One, Nebuchadnezzar, when Nebuchadnezzar entered in in his third excursion against the nation of Israel, also dealt with Edom. And so they were uh, dealt with in uh, about 586. But secondly, later on in their history, in uh, actually 126 A.D., under a leader by the name of John Hyrcanus, uh, they were destroyed and wiped out. And uh, that happened, like I said, in 126 under this particular leadership, 126 A.D. So they were wiped out, and, and the Lord is, is dealing with that. He said, you shall be desolate. You'll know that I am the Lord. He goes on to say, because you have had, and he gives a reason why, you have had an ancient hatred and have shed the blood of the children of Israel by the power of the sword at the time of their calamity when their iniquities came to an end. You have had an ancient hatred. In other words, it is well known that it's long-standing. It began during the time of your father Esau. It was continuing to the day of the writing here of Ezekiel. And as I mentioned, in 586, the Bab Babylon invaded Israel. And uh, when that happened, the, uh, the Jews fled. And as the Jews were fleeing, they fled to territory that was held by the Edomites. And the Edomites actually put them to death. They actually put them to the sword. That's what he's referring to when he says, you have shed the blood of the children of Israel. Not only, in other words, were they ancient enemies, but they continued their animosity even unto that day. Now, there's another prophet by the name of Obadiah. And Obadiah, verse 11 says, in the day that you stood on the other side, in the day that strangers carried captive his forces, when foreigners entered his gates and cast lots for Jerusalem, even you were one of them. And so God had, a, uh, had something to deal with with the Edomites. They were enemies of Israel and desired to see Israel destroyed. And therefore God says, I will deal with you. Notice how he says in verse 6, Therefore as I live says the Lord God, I will prepare you for blood. Blood shall pursue you. Since you have not hated blood, therefore blood shall pursue you. When he says you haven't hated blood, you have no hatred for blood, he's saying you don't have a problem with killing. You don't have a problem with death. You don't have a problem with blood. And, and, and since you don't have a problem with blood you are going to have blood pursue you. In other words, seeing that you haven't minded killing others, others are going to kill you. Now, this is called the law of retribution. It's called the law of retribution or principle of retribution. They're going to receive retribution in kind. You have done this, you shall receive this. You have pursued people and killed them, they will pursue you and kill you. It's called retribution in kind. In Psalm 109, for example, verse 17, it says, As he loved cursing, 
so let it come to him. As he did not delight in blessing, so let it be far from him. The law of retribution. You basically are going to receive what you've done to others. God is saying, my justice is right because you're simply going to accept what you've done to somebody else. It's going to happen to you. And God is making it very clear that he's going to do this. He's the author of it. In verse 7, thus I will make Mount Seir most desolate and cut off from it the one who leaves and the one who returns. And I will fill its mountains with the slain on your hills and in your valleys and in all your ravines, those who are slain by the sword shall fall. I will make you perpetually desolate. Your cities shall be uninhabited. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. You're going to be cut off. You're going to be cut off by war. People are going to cease traveling through you. That will include the trade caravans. The caravans that would bring to you things from the east, from India and various other places, and, and the things that you commercially have been made wealthy by. So you're going to become desolate in that way. And not only that, but when he says in verse 8, I will fill its mountains with the slain, in the Middle East, uh, people who are lying dead in the open ground in an unburied fashion, well, that's the highest indignity for somebody from the Middle East. And so he's saying that you are going to have a life that is desolate in every way, shape, and form. And even when you die, you're going to die in that particular condition. He says in verse 9, I'll make you perpetually desolate. Your city shall be uninhabited, and then you shall know that I am the Lord. Now, Obadiah, once again, in verse 18 said, The house of Esau shall be stubble. They shall kindle them and devour them. No survivor shall remain in the house of Esau, for the Lord has spoken. You know, there's an interesting scripture, if you take notes, it's in the New Testament. It's found in the book of Hebrews. It's found in chapter 10, verse 31. And it simply says that it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. You know, a lot of people have this tendency of, of mocking the Lord. We live in a, a nation that seems to make sport of God quite often. And... Um, it's done in a variety of ways, quite obviously. Very often what it's done, though, is in the mockery of the Christian church. There seems to be almost a joyful glee that some people get out of attacking the church. I get letters from students, uh, young men and women who are in college, and, and more than one has written to me recently saying that their, their teachers are openly antagonistic towards the Christian faith. Some of you perhaps who go to college or have been there, you know that's the truth. You know that's absolutely true. Not every, not every professor is like that. There are professors that have an openness. And, and when I went to school in the ancient days where we used to write on tablets of stone, when, when, I, when I went to, to school, you know, there were some teachers that uh, actually seemed to appreciate conversation and and uh, appreciated a dissenting view, appreciated sometimes a Christian perspective. I remember one particular teacher I had in a, in a socio sociology class. It was sociology of the family. I remember one who, so he was a nice guy. And uh, I, he gave us an assignment. It was a, uh, you were to write a, a, a paper and all. And, and so I wrote on, and this was back in the, the um, mid-70s, I wrote on the uh, place of the father in the home. And, uh, you know, sp I spoke concerning the father being the priest of the home and, and the responsibility that a man should have as a leader in the home. And, and I, I mentioned to him that I went into the library. It was a library of m multiple thousands of books. This was a secular college, Cal Poly Pomona. And it had thousands of books. And I went to the section that related to parenting. And I wrote in my paper, I still remember writing this, that that I was doing research on the role of a father in the home. I said, and I couldn't find a single book at that time that was written on the role of a father in a home. And, and I realized, of course, that this was in a secular university, but you would think that within the university there would be a library with multiple thousands of volumes that would have something written concerning a man's role in the home. There was absolutely nothing that I could find other than one book that was written on the man's role in the home by a woman. So I found that really interesting. I, I didn't take the time to read it. I, 
already had heard that from Marie. <laughs> but I, I mentioned to him, I said, you know, there isn't anything that is in recent literature that I can find here in the library. And I said, I'd like to use, though, as my text for that which I believe is important as it relates to a, a man's role, I'd like to use Scripture. And, and I wrote concerning the role of a father and the role of the priest and the man as the priest of the home, how he's to lead his family in the things of the Lord. And I wrote a paper like that. And, uh, you know, this professor was real open, you know, gave me a good grade. I got an A. I was one of the few I got. I, I appreciated that. But beyond that, as, we, as, as he wrote, he said, I have never heard this before. I've never heard this before. You see, sometimes when young people go to college, they're, they're so enamored by the professor that, that they just want to say anything that they think the professor will nod their head and say, oh, very deep, very solid, very good. They don't want to say anything to dissent with the professor, what they think that his or her ideas are concerning the subject. They don't want to get a bad grade. And so what they end up doing over four years is compromising the faith. They begin to learn more about what that professor thinks than they do what God thinks on the subject. And as a result of that, at the end of four years, they've thrown away their faith. We see that happen quite often. They go in at 18 as a professing believer in Christ and come out at 22 as a person who's agnostic or has turned away from Christ. Completely. We see that happen quite frequently in our ministry. It's because they're not holding fast to the things of the Word of God. It's because they're not willing to stand up and say, Thus saith the Lord. It's because they don't understand these kinds of things. And what happens is, is there is this mentality that is uh, actually, it, 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 and you'll see this in a moment, it, it, was, it was true in the time of, of, of Ezekiel. It, it can almost, it can have a blasphemous mentality, it's this God-rejecting mentality that you actually begin to, to find yourself open to. And uh, the result is, is that you fail to realize that, uh, that there truly is a God. And, and, and though we may right now in this, this comfort that we live in here in the United States, and we do live in comfort, uh, things are going well. You know, we go home tonight, we climb into a bed. Most of us will climb into a bed that has blankets on it. We have a house that we're living in, most of us. We go home and, you know, can have a meal. We can have enough food so that we gain weight and we complain about our weight, make New, New Year's resolutions, how we're going to lose weight. You know, and, and we may do that for three months and we gain it again and then next year we say we're going to lose some weight again. But we live in a place where we can overeat. We live in a place where we have more than one pair of shoes, more than one pair of pants, more than one jacket. We live in a place that we're willing to spend a lot of money to get our hair cut, those of us who have it. <laughs> we live in these conditions and, and, and in these comfortable conditions we can raise our puny fists and actually shake them in the face of God and say, well, if there truly is a God, then I, I curse you to your face. What are you going to do about it? Didn't do anything. There must not be a God. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God because all of us will give an account of ourselves in the day of judgment. And though we may right now be feeling very comfortable and very haughty, and the world may feel that way, Ultimately, and this is what Ezekiel is pointing to, by the way, ultimately, we will stand before God, and it is a fearful thing to anger Him. Now, he says in verse 10, because you have said, these two nations and these two countries shall be mine, and we will possess them, although the Lord was there. Therefore, as I live, says the Lord God, I will do according to your anger and according to the envy which you have showed in your hatred against them. And I will make myself known among them when I judge you. And then you shall know that I am the Lord. I have heard all your blasphemies which you have spoken against the mountains of Israel, saying they're desolate, they're given to us to consume. And thus with your mouth you've boasted against me. Multiplied your words against me, I have heard them. Thus says the Lord God, the whole earth will rejoice when I make you desolate. As you rejoiced because the inheritance of the house of Israel was desolate, so I will do to you. You shall be desolate, O Mount Seir, as well as all of Edom, all of it. Then they shall know that I am the Lord. Now, in verse 10, notice how he speaks and he says, listen, you have said these two nations and these two countries shall be mine 
and we will possess them, although the Lord was there. Now, what is he dealing with? He's dealing with their arrogant pride. They're speaking of two nations and two countries, and these two nations and two countries that they're referring to would be really what we refer to as the single nation of Israel. You need to remember that Israel had been divided into two sections. You need to remember that after Solomon, the son of David, died, that he has a son by the name of uh, Rehoboam. And Rehoboam had a conflict. And Rehoboam, in his conflict, resulted in the division of the nation of Israel into two segments. You have what is called the ten northern tribes that is referred to in the Bible as Israel. And then you have the two southern tribes, which is referred to as, as Judah. And so during the time of Ezekiel, when Edom was speaking concerning the nation of Israel, they would refer to them as those two countries or those two nations. And so what he's speaking about here is the fact that Edom is saying that Israel belongs to them. They are saying that Edom thinks that she's now going to occupy the land that was actually promised to Israel. Now, God regathers the nation of Israel. But at this time, they were in exile. The ten northern tribes had been taken by the Assyrians and dispersed in 732 B.C. The two southern tribes had been overrun by Babylon on three specific occasions from 606 down to 586. And as a result of that, Ezekiel is now in Babylonian captivity. Edom is seeing that the nation looks to be desolate. So Edom is beginning to say, I'm going to go over there and I'm going to occupy the land. God is saying, you're forgetting that somebody owns it. It's like when you go on vacation, say you take a two-week vacation and you're gone and somebody's going through your neighborhood and they say, that house is empty. I'll just bring my bags in and, and I'll live there. Well, that's what they're doing. You come home and you say, now, wait a minute, this house is occupied. And they say, yeah, by me. And you say, no, by me. I own the house. That's what the Lord is saying. They're saying that country is desolate. Assyria has taken them. Babylon's taken them. Jerusalem has been taken. It's empty. We're going to go and we're going to move our bags in. And God says, now, wait a minute. That's not going to happen. I'm there. You're not going to possess it. It belongs to me. That land belongs to me. And even though there is a temporary judgment that is falling on the nation, God is saying, I'm going to regather them. Now, he does regather them. We know all about that. And as they continue to exist as a nation, uh, they continue to do so for, for centuries. And then during the time of Christ, in A.D. 70, once again, the nation falls, and this time it fell to Rome. Now, when that was taking place, Edom was occupying southern Israel at that time. And so Edom was there. And as they entered in and began to, to, to occupy uh, all the way up to close to the city of Jerusalem, as they began to occupy, they once again began to think that that belonged to them. But, as I mentioned earlier, with Hyrcanus, in 126 A.D., they were forced to convert, uh, and in doing so, they were absorbed into the nation. Now, God's eyes were still on Israel. They thought that God had forgotten that he owned the land, but God hadn't. He simply had tempor temporarily removed his presence. And he's saying that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a work there. And so he's speaking concerning this. Now, in verse 11, when he says, Therefore, as I live, says the Lord God, I'll do according to your anger and according to the envy which you showed in your hatred against him, and I will make myself known among them when I judge you. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. I have heard all your blasphemies which you have spoken against the mountains of Israel. When God begins to speak, he begins to speak concerning the, the recompense that's going to occur. And he's going to, once again, he's going to bring them recompense in kind. They're going to receive what they've given. They're going to receive the kinds of things. And they've been speaking. They've said, these nations are going to belong to us. They have anger. They have envy. And they've been speaking blasphemies. And God is saying, I am going to deal with you for the things that you've been saying about my nation. Interestingly, 
In the New Testament book of Matthew, chapter 7, verse 2, listen to what Jesus said. Jesus said, with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. That's called the principle of recompense. You've had anger and you've had envy. You've had hatred and you've spoken, spoken blasphemies. Now this anger, envy, and hatred is going to be poured out on you. You showed no mercy, therefore you will receive no mercy. Notice verse 11, I will make myself known among them when I judge you. Now, Israel and Judah will recognize that God has done this work. When he says among them, he's speaking of, of Israel. They're going to recognize God did this work when Edom is judged. And Israel and the surrounding nations will see that God loves that nation. Now, when he says in verse 12, you shall know that I am the Lord. I have heard all your blasphemies which you've spoken against the mountains of Israel, saying they're desolate, they're given to us to consume. Thus, he says, with your mouth, you've boasted against me and multiplied your words against me. Now, I want you to see this. I have heard them. I have heard them. Though I am unseen, that doesn't mean I don't hear what you said. You know, I'm mic'd here, right? I can go into the back room and I could be talking to someone, the mic's on, and though you don't see me, you're hearing everything I'm saying. God is saying, you may not see me with your eye, but that doesn't mean I don't hear you with my ears. You may be speaking, thinking you're whispering, but you're actually shouting into the ear of God. And so things that people are saying, God says, I'm listening to. I've heard the things that you're saying, and I'm aware of the things that you're saying, and I'm going to hold you accountable for these things. Jude in the New Testament says that God will execute judgment upon all and convict all the ungodly of their ungodly deeds, which they've done in an ungodly way, and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Now, these people are speaking blasphemies. The word blasphemy is used in a variety of ways, but in general, it, it speaks of causing something to be less than it actually is, reducing. And they speak these, these things about God and his plan with the nation of Israel because they don't know him. Now, eventually, and I want you to see this. I'm going to read this again, verse 13. With your mouth you've boasted against me and multiplied your words against me. Eventually, we put our thoughts into words. And you can see that's a principle that's true. I mean... If you are constantly dwelling on crude things, if you constantly dwell on lustful things, well, you're eventually going to be saying crude things to people. If you have a, a bitter heart, well, that bitter heart is eventually going to produce resentful words, and you're going to be angry towards other people. When you have an insecurity within yourself, you can find yourself mocking and putting other people down because what begins in the heart eventually works its way out of the mouth. Out of the abundance of the heart, Jesus said, the mouth speaks. Now, if you have warm, loving, caring feelings towards somebody, you're going to have words that express that. If you have a sense of kindness towards somebody, there's going to be words of appreciation. It works both ways. But you see, the Edomites have been speaking blasphemies. And the reason that the Edomites have been speaking blasphemies is because they don't have a relationship with God. And so what was in their hearts came out of their mouths. Turn with me to Matthew for a second. I want to develop something with you. Matthew 12. Matthew chapter 12. And I want to read to you out of verses 35 through 37. I'm going to spend a few moments here, not long, but a few. And I'm going to highlight 
what I just read here in Ezekiel 35, 13, thus with your mouth you have boasted against me and multiplied your words against me. They have had angry words, bitter words, blasphemous words that came from the abundance of their heart. Now, in Matthew 12, 35, a good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth evil things. But I say to you that every, for every idle word men may speak, they will give account of it in the day of judgment. For by your words you'll be justified. By your words you will be condemned. Now, notice in verse 35, Jesus said, a good man out of the good treasure. When he says a good treasure of your heart, he's speaking of a treasury, that your heart is a treasury, if you will, and it contains things. So, my desire is to have a treasury filled with the good things that I can draw from. And the way for me to be able to have a, a heart that is filled with treasure that is worthy of drawing and, and, and speaking forth is simply to be born again. Because before I received Christ, my old nature, the Bible teaches, was in constant active hostility towards God. I was hostile towards the things of the Lord. A person who lives in the flesh, the Bible says in Romans, cannot please God. And, and that person's life is an open, hostile resistance to the things of God. We don't receive the things of the Spirit of God because they're foolishness to us. And so we live in bitter opposition to God's plan for our life. That's why the first time you heard the gospel, and as an unsaved individual, when you heard it as, as the first time I heard it, that's why I rejected it. Because I didn't want to yield myself to that way of life. I was hostile in opposition to it with hostility. No, I wasn't the rude kind of person, argumentative normally as it related to religious faith. I was really a hippie, so I was more tolerant. But the bottom line was, is when I was told that I needed to receive Christ as my Lord and Savior, and it was put in a point blank, you have to make this decision, I got hostile about that. I said, that's your opinion. That's how you think. That's what you believe. That's what you're thrusting down my throat. I got hostile towards that. I said, that's the way you want to believe? That's fine for you. But don't be pushing that on me because I don't have to believe what you believe. Simply because you believe that doesn't make it true. And like, like everybody in this room, that was generally my attitude. I had a hostile uh, opposition to things of God. And when people would say, you got to be born again to enter into the kingdom of heaven, I'd say, that's your Protestant theology. That's what you believe. I wasn't raised that way, and my church is just as good as yours, and the, and the teachings I've received are just as solid as yours, and I was very argumentative about that. And I'd say, listen, you can believe what you want to believe, and I'm not going to argue with you. If it makes you better, then that's fine. I want you to be better. If it gives you peace, like you say it does, that's good. I want you to have peace. You want to have those things, that's good for you. But why do you want to force me to think like you? Because I didn't see it. I didn't see it. I was hostily opposed to it. I saw it as, as, a, uh, as a set of ideas. I saw it as a personal philosophy. I saw it as a way of thinking that was foreign to me because I was in opposition to that without even knowing it. I fell under what God says in Romans 8, 5 through 7. Absolutely. And because that was true, when my friend tried to convince me, I would argue with him hammer and tongue. There's absolutely no way that I'm going to be able to do that. I am not going to hold fast to those things. You can, but I'm not going to. It requires a new nature for me to be able to draw from a heart good things because all I can draw out of my treasury before I'm born again and have that new nature is evil. That's what Jesus said. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things, and an evil man out of the evil treasures brings forth evil things. Evil things. Obviously, there are degrees of evil, and not every person does as much evil as somebody else. Some people's evil is seen very openly. Other people's evil is hidden very well. Speaking about a nature. And there are some people who have a, a great outer appearance but their nature is still evil. You can dress a baboon in a tuxedo. It's still a baboon. You can have a good out appearance, 
And frankly, I, I, I like being around good people. I'm more comfortable around the good people who are unsaved, good people in the sense that they're nice, they're, you know, ethical. Uh, I, I, I like being around them and, and all. They're, they're much more comfortable. It's more difficult to be around some who are very openly, angrily sinful. And I think we all understand what I'm trying to say there. But God says there's none good, no, not one. There's none righteous, no, not one. So no matter how I dress up this, this, this body of death, it's still death. No matter how you dress it up, it's still dead. It's still dead. I need life. That's why Jesus said, you must be born again. Because we are actually spiritually dead even from conception because we have a sin nature. And it's from that sin nature that my life produces all the sinful activities. An unbeliever, because they have a sin nature, produces unprofitable words. That's because his life isn't filled with the treasures of God's grace. Ultimately, what happens is he rejects Christ, and his rejection of Christ will be demonstrated by his verbal rejection of Jesus Christ. So when someone says, you need to receive the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and the unregenerate who is bent on remaining so says, no, I don't. They are verbally rejecting. And that's what the Lord Jesus Christ is saying when he says, I say to you that every idle word, and that word idle means unprofitable, every idle word men may speak, they will give an account of it in the day of judgment. For by your words you'll be justified, by your words you'll be condemned. You see, a believer confessed Christ. He said, I believe that the Lord Jesus Christ, that's what we did, I believe that Jesus Christ is God in human flesh. I believe that Jesus Christ lived a sinless life, so much so that he could actually say to a group of people, which could have included his mother and brothers and sisters, and he could have said, which of you can convict me of sin? And not a single one of them could say, I can. Mary couldn't. She raised a perfect child, like my mother did with me. No, she raised a perfect child. Don't laugh so loud. It hurts. She raised a perfect child. So Mary herself could not say, oh, you did this, you disobeyed, you used this foul language. Never. Nobody could. The only human being who ever lived a perfect life is the Lord Jesus Christ. He was without sin. And that's why we sinners need someone like him because he's able to do for us what we can't do for ourselves because the Bible teaches he kept the perfect requirements of his father. He did all those things and always pleased him. And so we believe that. We believe that Jesus Christ took upon himself the sin of the world as the Lamb of God. We believe that Jesus was placed on a cross and he died not for his sins but for mine and for ours. And that he ultimately literally died and was buried. We believe that three days later, he resurrected from the dead and spent time with his disciples ministering to them and then ultimately ascended into heaven. And we believe that he sent the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost to dwell within those who were there waiting in an upper room, 120, and that the church was born and that for 2,000 years, the gospel message that declares you must be born again has been the true message to the degree we embraced it and we present it. And so when somebody comes forward at an invitation, it isn't the walking up that aisle that is saving them. You see, I've had people say, well, if you don't give a, an open invitation, Pastor David, can people get saved? Well, of course, of course. You get saved the moment that you open your heart to Christ. You're saved when you're sitting out there in that pew. The reason I asked you to come up here is so that you can make an open declaration of that, so that you can live for Christ openly from the moment that you make that decision. Uh, in, in Matthew 10, Jesus said it like this in verses 32 and 33, whoever confesses me before men, him will I confess also before my Father who's in heaven. 
But whoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father who is in heaven. So on the one hand, when you openly say yes and follow Christ, it will be something people see. But a person who denies, a person who says, I don't need him, they themselves ultimately, when they stand before the living God, are going to be totally rejected. There are people today who understand the principle of rejection. They know what it's like to have a mom who didn't love them or a dad who didn't love them, a grandmother or a father, brother or sister who rejected them. And the pain that they felt and that they still sometimes carry to this day where they were the abandoned child. Nobody wanted them. And, and that's pain. That's terrible pain. But it isn't going to be the same kind of pain as when that person, if they don't give their hearts to Christ, are ultimately rejected by Him. That's the total rejection. That's why Paul said in Romans 10, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. With the heart, man believes unto righteousness. With the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. That's why we can say by the Spirit of God, Jesus is Lord. These Edomites are speaking blasphemies because these Edomites lack a relationship with God. Turning back to chapter 35 and concluding, even as you turn there, Peter said, they will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. Ultimately, they will give that account. And God says again in verse 13, with your mouth you've boasted against me, multiplied your words against me. Like college professors who love to steal the, the faith out of the, the students like TV people who like to put down comedians who love to tear up Christians. Your mouth you've boasted against me, multiplied your words against me, but I've heard them. Thus says the Lord God, the whole earth will rejoice when I make you desolate. As you rejoiced because the inheritance of the house of Israel was desolate, so I will do to you. You shall be desolate, O Mount Seir, as well as all of Edom, all of it. Then they shall know that I am the Lord. You see, Edom rejoiced when Israel was under painful conditions, but now others will rejoice over Edom. And the destruction of Edom will validate God's word to them. Finally, this chapter is connected to the covenant that God made all the way back in Genesis 12 with Abram when he said in verses 2 and 3, I'll make, a, make you a great nation. I will bless you. Make your name great. And you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. You see, when a, a nation perpetually hates the nation of Israel, they are giving themselves over to God, bringing that nation into desolation. When a nation turns their back on Israel, and God said it all the way back in the beginning, he said, if they bless you, I will bless them. If they curse you, I will curse them. All the way back in the beginning. That's still true, by the way. That's still true to this day. The leader of Iran, Ahmadinejad, should be made aware of that. And you guys need to pray for our president. That he, can, that he continues the history of our nation's love for, for Israel. I truly get concerned about that. I truly do. We are the nation that was the deciding nation for Israel to be recognized as a nation once again. And the loyalty that the United States has shown to Israel over the years I believe, has been blessed by God. We as a nation are blessed by God because he said, I will bless those who bless you. I pray for our president. I pray for our nation. I pray for the church that we keep praying for Israel, that God may bring peace, that God may open their eyes, that they might see Messiah, Jesus, that they might come to faith in their Messiah. And I think we ought to keep praying that way because when a nation hates Israel, they give themselves over to God who will judge that nation. And God did judge 
the nation of Edom. And I believe that he still judges nations that turn their backs on Israel.